Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're really pleased today to have Angel Jafria with us. Angel has been uh, doing a number of things, actress, model, uh, and also part self-confessed cyborg. So welcome. It's, it's great to have you with us. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm in awe of your arm. I think it's an amazing piece of technology. I, I grew up watching Star Wars, and you're the closest thing to like Luke Skywalker. I, you know, I, I, I've yet to have a conversation with her. It's fantastic. So, so tell us a bit about yourself. Um, I am obviously, like you said, an actress. I'm in grad school. I'm getting my master's in psychology. I look at a lot of things that have to do with amputees and stigma, um, persons with disabilities. So it kind of, psychology was always something that was really interesting to me because I like to know how people reacted and were aware of. Um, I was born without my arm. I never had an arm. I grew up without it. You know, I thought that that was just how I was supposed to be. And it kind of, as I was growing up, it, it, it really, you know, blew my mind, confused me when people thought there was something wrong with me just because I was missing my arm. Like, this is kind of just the way I am, the way I was from the beginning. So I never thought there was an issue with it. But growing up and seeing people's reactions is what really changed psychology. And then interested in psychology made me interested in acting because in acting is reacting. It's picking up off emotions and how people feel. And like that. It's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun trying to figure out how to navigate the world. So, um, so how, long have you had your, how long have you had your arm? Because it's an amazing bit of kit. Right, like you said, um, I'm still kind of in awe of it. I just got it in uh, March of 2015 when it first came out. It's actually the very first small size hand, so I don't know if you can see. This might be kind of jarring. You ready for this? But so <laughs> the hand is actually very small. Before this, I was wearing a hand that was, watch this, this is very easy. It's like plug and play and it's right back on. Um, <laughs> but um, before this, I was wearing a hand that was three times the size of my hand. I was blessed with a very tiny hand, <laughs> just one. So throughout my life, it was difficult with prosthetics because most prosthetics were made for grown men. And they would develop one type, and they would say they would come out with a small one, but then they would just come out with another type, and they'd advance the next arm and advance the next arm. And they kept saying, oh, we're going to make it smaller. And that never really happened. So I kind of gave up on that. So um, I tested an arm, a prosthesis, for uh, the Department of Defense or the Department of Veterans Affairs in the U.S. called the DECA prosthesis, which was very, very cool. Um, but I did look like I was from like Tron or something. It had blinking lights and it had wires running all around me and sensors on my shoes and a battery pack on my hip and it weighed six pounds. But I was determined to test it because if it's useful, I wanted it. You know, if it worked and it was, it was good for me, I was willing to do the six pounds and wear the arm. But uh, at the end of the study, I mean, I was happy with it. They had a, it has a really cool wrist that is active flexion and extension, so I can control it with my muscles to bend the wrist, which isn't out yet. Nobody really has that. Uh, there is one company that's working on it that I got to see at one of the shows last um, last month, so that's really cool. But I got to test it out, and that was awesome. But everyone who saw me would go, whoa, because the hand was so jarring that it was so much bigger than me. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, the movie Hellboy, it, it just looked like I had this big fist. And, you know, when I wore it and I looked down, I was all happy with it. And then I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, that's intense. So after I, I stopped that study and they took the hand back, which, you know, was kind of sad. But uh, after they took the hand back, I was like, you know what? I need a new bionic hand because the one I had at this point was old. It was several years old. They had way new, new developments. And I, I found this be bionic hand. And it was the medium size because that was the smallest size there was in any bionic hand was the bionic medium. And I tested it out. I went to my prosthetic office and I was like, this is it. This is the one I want. I went to order it. And of course my insurance denied it several times. And we can talk about that if you want, because insurance companies, right? Not medically necessary apparently, but um, they said no several times. And then my prosthetist calls me and says, Angel, can you, can you wait? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, there's a small hand. And I'm going, yeah, sure. I'm sure there's a small hand. Because I didn't believe that at that point. 
I'm like, let me see it. And they actually had pictures and a release date and everything. And it was this hand. So it was like, wait a second, you're telling me that I can have the really cool hand I want actually in my size for like the first time ever. So I was like, I'll wait, I'll wait the month to get the hand. I don't know if you can see the thumb size, but it's really, it's, it's spot on in it's comparison to what I used to wear. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a really good match. So I guess we do kind of want to to touch on the stuff about insurance because I think it's important to a lot of people, um, especially in the States where insurance rules everything. Um, and, and then I know that after that, Deborah will have a question. Yeah, insurance here is, it's actually funny. I, I'm, I'm the youngest in the world to wear a myoelectric prosthesis. I was four months, 10 days old when I got my first arm. That is very, very um, strange. A lot of insurance companies, even then, when I, 20 something years ago when I was born, they, they were not very likely to approve a child's prosthetic. For one, they're growing constantly, so that means you have to give them arms constantly. And two, for some reason they have this idea that if a baby doesn't need it, they'll say, oh, oh they're not even using it at that point. They, they don't need it, which from my experience is the opposite. Pretty much what they did with me and why I think I'm such a successful story of wearing a prosthetic is because I grew up wearing it and not wearing it. When you wait till a child is three, four, five years old to give them a prosthesis, especially when they're born without their arm, they've learned to do everything. Now, it doesn't mean that they've learned to do it the best way that they can do it or the fastest or the most efficient. They've learned a way because we all adapt. We're all going to figure out a way to do something we want to do no matter what. People don't realize that but they're going to figure out a way. So when you put this prosthetic on them at five years old, you're getting in the way of what they've already learned how to do. It doesn't mean it's the best way. It just means you're in the way. And as a kid, what are they going to do? They're going to pull it off and they're going to say, I know how to do this already. It's the similar idea to like a traumatic amputee. They knew how to do things with two arms or two legs. When they lose a limb, they have to relearn. They don't get a choice. Pretty much you're giving a congenital amputee the choice. They say, do you want to relearn? And they're like, no, I already know how to do this. So I think if you get fit earlier in your life, you learn, like I, I went through my days with my arm on, some days with it off. I learned to do things both ways. So I never felt like it was in the way. Now, my mom was very, very pushy. And she's the reason that I have this myoelectric, the entire reason. Uh, it's a really cool story. The very first myoelectrics for children were being fit in the U.S. when I was born. Very first, um, they brought him over from Canada, Drew Combs, and this this group of uh, this prosthetics group in Houston, Texas. My mom was on bed rest with me, had no idea that I had one arm, none. And she watched this program on the news called My Electrics Make Children Whole, and she cried through the whole thing because they're giving these babies arms, and she was so happy about it, not knowing that a month later I was going to be born and I was going to be missing my hand. So when I was born. And they checked out everything else to make sure, you know, I didn't have any other problems besides the fact that I was missing my arm. Um, she said, I can get her a hand. And everybody went, what? She said, no, no, I've seen it. They have little ones, little hands that I can get her. And the doctors are going, how much did, you know, what did, <laughs> what did we give her? Is she all right? And she's like, no, no, I, I've seen it. So the internet wasn't a thing then. So uh, she got home and was like, how am I going to find these people? That do this. She didn't remember where it was. It didn't apply to her at the time. Why would she have written it down? So it just so happened that the newspaper in Baton Rouge, where I lived in Louisiana at the time, ran the story the week after I was born. And all my neighbors showed up with the newspaper article. And within the week, we were there. My mom put in for my insurance claim saying, I want my baby to have this myoelectric hand. And sorry, I'm resetting something on my computer. I want my baby to have this myoelectric hand. And she said, and they said, oh, no, that she won't need it. <laughs> My mom wasn't going to take that for an answer. <laughs> she uh, kind of went in and put me down on somebody's desk and said, tell my baby she can't have a hand. So <laughs> at that point, there was, there was no saying no. But there's a lot of people who do that, and it still doesn't work. So she just happened to luck out. And I was able to wear prosthetics throughout my life. I had never gotten a rejection until... I asked for my bionic hand. And that's with the new insurance changes that have come into play in the last couple of years. It used to be they'd call me and they'd say, why do you need this? This hand is expensive. And I'd say, I need an activity arm because I am a cheerleader. I run cross country. 
I need a myoelectric hand because I want to be able to carry grocery bags in my house. I want to be able to pick things up with two hands. I want to, and they'd say, okay, that makes sense. That is not what happened this last time. They, I asked for three different types of hands and my prosthetist with the new insurance rules knew what was going on. I hadn't asked for a hand in a while. And he said, are you sure you want to do that? And I'm like, yeah. To me, it didn't seem like a big deal. I'd always asked for more than one hand and it seemed like an okay thing. I asked for an activity arm, a new cosmetic arm, which is what I have and wear occasionally. It's a passive prosthetic. It looks just like my hand, except for it has no function. It doesn't move. It's just kind of like a placeholder. Um, and then I asked for the be bionic hand. I got a rejection letter stating, and I quote, you are only missing one hand. We are not going to approve three hands. Wow. And yeah, it was kind of like, I laughed. I laughed when I read it because it was, it was almost funny. And then I was like, wait a second, they're saying no. Because they don't get that there is no one prosthetic at this point that does all the things that I want it to do and need it to do. Yeah. And it was kind of like it, it, insulting at that point, you know? It, it, it was upsetting and, and it, it went through denial and denial and, and different things like that. And it just, it gets to a point where you're having a stack of paper this big of prosthetists, doctors, occupational therapists, you have to go through so much footwork that takes you mine over a year to get what you want because you have to convince them that I need this hand. When they're saying we only have to give you the most basic thing required. Well, to you, the most basic thing required is two hands and I don't see you giving me that. So how about you give me the next best thing? Yeah. But they don't see it that way. So that's kind of where we're having a, a disconnect with insurances nowadays. Okay, Deborah, I know you had a question. Angel, I, um, I'm so impressed with you and I already was very impressed with you and <laughs> you ha you're, I'm amazed. I'm just amazed by uh, your poise and your, um, the way you explain yourself. And, and I am very interested um, also as a mother of a, um, my daughter has Down syndrome. So, but y your, the stories of your mother remind you of myself and that uh, don't say no to right. me when it comes to the quality of life for my daughter. Don't say no. So um, I, I'm just really, really impressed with everything I'm hearing. And I know that there's a lot of insurance problems and um, access, access. And so, um, but the, the, the one of the things that you were talking about really, really speaks to me, which is um, you were born without a, a hand. So that's who you are. That's who you've always been. And as Jennifer Lawrence said on one of the videos I watched about you, um, hey, that's cool. It makes you unique. And so I love the spirit that you bring to these conversations because you're not broken. You're a beautiful, talented actress, um, track star, everything else. And so to decide that you are less because you weren't born with an arm, which probably was because you were going to change the world, showing us what we're capable of doing. I like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think a lot, of, and that's really the mission that I, part of the mission that I'm on, which is for people to understand that we're not broken because we're different, we're unique, we're valuable. So I don't I, know I, when different became such a negative word. Yeah. And that's what I always say to people. Like different isn't bad. We're all different. And that's the point. If we right. weren't different, it would be a very boring world. Like we have to be different. And the fact is uh, at some point, some differences became too different. And I don't know why. And I don't, and I don't know who's in charge of that, but it wasn't me. And I think that we should obviously be embracing our differences because that's the point of life. That's the point of interaction and meeting people and, and having fun and, and being yourself is the differences. And yeah, hopefully we should value people them. embrace that. Yeah, we should value those so we can learn from each other. Um, I just, I love, I love the whole package. So I'm just very, very impressed and glad to know you. So I know there are other questions, so I'll stop, but very impressed, Angel. Yeah, uh, you were telling uh, you were telling your 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 story, you know, and about the, the resilience of your mother, you know, trying to pursue, you know, trying to find the best for you. you know, but you know, but uh, today we are, you know, we see so many people, you know, um, around posting all of about, about 3D, to, and uh, about technology, about availability. Right. So there's a difference between the reality the reality of people who actually need the arm 
and all the news and updates that we see on the, on the web from all these different companies. So from your experience, if uh, from contacting other people who, are, who could have been in the same situation with you, can you tell us about, you know, how you balance all this information that overload us with the need of having an arm and then the incapacity of actually having it? Right. Um, it's funny because for the longest time, I had the same type of prosthetic. I had a basic myoelectric hand that has the three prong grass that does this. It was they sometimes referred to them as cookie crunchers when I was younger because they would just close and break things <laughs> or pinch people as I like to do as a kid. Um, but when um, after 9-11 and once the war happened in the U.S., all of the funding started going towards prosthetics, which was great for me. I know, you know, obviously that's not the, the, the happiest thing, but war always brings advancements in technology, always. So it became a point where I was used to having the same thing. I had the same type of arm with only one difference. Um, the elect I went from having one electrode in my arm to having two electrodes from when I was a baby till I was around 13 to 14 years old. So all of a sudden when they're, the new arms, the multi-articulating hands started coming out, I was on the internet because at this point the internet was a thing. I was on the internet going, what is this? What is this? And it, it got to be almost like, a very broad comparison, but like a phone, like, do, do I get this one now? Or do I try to wait and get the next one? Because, you know, insurance probably is not going to approve. And same thing with a two year contract, you know, <laughs> they're going to say, you know, you've already gotten one, you got to wait, different things like that, which is a little different than a phone. <laughs> but um, good analogy, though. Yeah. But it's the idea that uh, there were so many new things coming out so fast, and you had to decide what was important to you. And that was hard, because I'm seeing these hands that had grip patterns. So I was used to, let me show you, this is the basic, the three jaw chops, the three fingers that you use. And then all of a sudden, I was able to do something like this, where I could pick up a dime or a key off a table. And the idea was before that, with that three jaw chuck, I wasn't gonna be able to do that. So I was looking at these things on the internet and going, is that important to me? Do I wanna pick up a, a dime? Like, I think it is, I think I wanna do that. Or do I, do I want a rotating wrist? Do I want something that allows me to turn my, yeah, I think I want that. Or do I, do I wait for all these things? And it got to be hard. And I, I you know, you, you have to make these choices. And my prosthetist would be like, well, do you really want to ask for the wrist? Or do you think they're going to give you the hand if you ask for that too? And I'm like, can they do that? It was the idea that kind of blew my mind of, yeah, I want both. Why would I not want both? Of course, <laughs> and then it's like, wait a second, do I have to choose? And that was another thing that happened with my insurance company. When they said, you're only missing one hand and you asked for three, I said, are they making me choose? They're making me choose between the myoelectric hand that I use every day for daily living tasks, from tying my shoes to carrying groceries to pulling my suitcase. They're making me choose between the cosmetic hand that has no um, uh, mechanical function, but looks real when I want to go into a situation and say, you know what, I don't want people to know I have one arm today. That's none of their business. Maybe I'm having a day like that because I'm allowed to have a day like that. I'm human, you know, or I want my activity arm that I can wear to, to run, to do kickboxing, to do yoga, to balance on. And yeah, I can use devices in those classes. I've used a medicine ball or a basu ball, but wearing my activity arm makes my life a hundred percent easier in those situations. So they're telling me I get to, get to either do these activities I get to either blend in when I want to, or I get to do my daily life. And it was kind of like, you're telling me one. And that was frustrating, you know? Um, but with the new advancements in 3D printing, it's actually really cool. And and I can't, I, I got to meet a really great company. They're called Open Bionics. I went to Russia this past summer for a conference called uh, Geek Picnic, uh, which was amazing. Went to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and I got to talk about being a cyborg and, you know, different things like that. And there were several other people wearing prosthetics and several other biohackers. And I got to meet some really, really cool people that do really, really cool things. And I met Open Bionics. Um, they're the ones, if you've seen the 3D printed Frozen arm, the Marvel arm, they're amazing. Um, they talked to me about a lot of things that I, I, I wasn't aware of. And the idea of 3D printing is really cool for kids, especially because it is so difficult to get insurance companies to cover these arms. So even at the, the, pro, the amount of progress they're at now, so this is where the misconceptions come in. People say, oh, is that one of those 3D printed arms? No, no, because where 3D printed arms are at right now is not anywhere close to where my arm is. 
durability wise, um, grip strength wise. I got to play with one of them. They're so they're very fast. That is one thing that they do have over my arm. They're very quick. Um, they're light too, and they're easy to make, and they're inexpensive for making a hand for a hundred to three hundred dollars. In comparison to how much my hand costs, that's kind of like mind blowing. But the idea is they're not where they need to be yet. I'm not saying they won't be there. They will 100% be there, hopefully, in the next coming years. I, I would say short term, they're going to be where they need to be. But for kids, where they are right now is fantastic because they grow so fast. They can get new arms and get used to wearing a myoelectric and having it there and how to do things at a young age without having to worry about all that insurance stuff at this point. So a lot of the programs that they have, like Enable and a lot of them that allow for you to go in and get a prosthetic at a young age are so great because it is so difficult to get a prosthetic when you're young. But 3D printing is coming along and quickly, and I'm excited to see it because it also allows for a level of customization that a lot of the commercially produced hands don't have. I have some cool hands that I have where I've put lights in them or I've gotten them to make my Stormtrooper socket. This is my carbon fiber, but I have several different sockets. I have a see-through one and different things like that. And the, the 3D printed arms allow for you to customize your own arm. I've seen ones with crystals and I've seen ones that shoot glitter just for fun and things like that. I mean, which sounds really upsetting if you have glitter all over your house as a mom, but I'm just, <laughs> but it allows for a level of customization to make, make prosthetics fun. Yeah. For so long, I grew up with a hand I was told had to be skin colored that looked real, but not really. And it was so in between, um, that it wasn't enough. My, my, my passive cosmetic is great. It does look very real, but it doesn't move. And that for good reason is it was too hard to make it move and look real at this point to make yeah. it match my hand exactly. So with, with the ones that you can make fun, it's like, why not do something that a hand can't do like shoot glitter or have lights in it? Why not take something that is not exactly a hand yet and make it fun to show people and make it cool. When I go up to kids nowadays, I'm like, you're, you're an Iron Man? You know, we, me and Iron Man, you know, we're kind of close. Or, oh, I have a robot arm. Oh, that's a robot arm? <laughs> it's just so cool nowadays because of film and different things like that. I can make these comparisons. My favorite is Finding Nemo. I didn't have that one as a kid. When kids asked why I was born without my arm, I had to explain because I was made that way and that's why. And they under the impression that that's bad. So bad. This doesn't mean anything's wrong. Sorry, did my power disappoint? Hold on. One second. I live in the middle of nowhere, so yeah, the power surge. So, so, if anyone ever doubted that we were live, <laughs> hello. hello. <laughs> We're live. Um, but, uh, so I, I've got a quick question. So you ahead. talked about your, your, your cosmetic um, and you talked about the, the, you know, the difference between wearing that and your, your myoelectric. Um, how long do you think it's going to be before you only need the two? You'll have your activity arm and then maybe you only need the one because obviously things are advancing pretty fast now. So um, It's funny which, because I like having my cosmetic arm. But I also like having my cool arm. So now I don't know if they could make my cosmetic arm because this hand comes in a cosmetic glove. They right. could do that and they could pull it all the way up. Now, it's not an exact replica of my hand, an exact one like my cosmetic arm. But this hand is, is like you said, pretty close. It's pretty spot on. Yeah. So I could technically cover it in a cosmetic glove. Um, but I don't know. It's It's kind of... Nice having people know up front who I am because the issue I had with my cosmetic arm a lot of the time was when do I tell people I have one arm? Yeah. Because it got to be sometimes okay, my this is I, I dated a Marine Corps infantry officer for a while and uh, he was stationed in California. We did it for five years and I was there visiting him last year and his new neighbors from the floor below us, he lived right on the beach in California, came up and they were talking to us and I had on my cosmetic arm. And I think I had maybe like a jacket over me, you know, it's cold in California at night. And they were talking about surfing, of course, in California. And they started to talk about Bethany Hamilton, the girl who lost her arm in the shark attack that's a surfer. Okay. And they started talking about being an amputee. And they started saying things like, I don't know what I would do with my life. Oh, and I'm going, they don't know. They haven't noticed. And my boyfriend at the time is looking at me and I'm going, do I tell them now? Do I let them find out later and go, oh, no, and put their foot in their mouth? No, it's, 
it's one of those things where you're sitting there like, oh gosh, this applies to me. Like they don't realize that they're saying something like, I think, I think it got to an extreme where they were like, I, I don't know if I could just, if I could live after that. I don't know how I'd go back to surfing. I don't know. And it was kind of like, like yeah. cringeworthy. You know, you're sitting there like, oh, and I'm like, guys, just, just to let you know, like I wear a prosthesis, I'm missing my arm. And everyone's kind of like, oh, oh, okay. Oh yeah. You know, but it would have been worse before or after. Like, you never know. Like, I don't know if later on they would have been at home going, oh my God, like that was so bad. Which, whichever you do, or there was a time when I was, I'm from New Orleans and we were in, we were somewhere in the quarter and we were dancing and some guy came up to me and said, dance with me and grabbed my hand. And I was like, oh, like I get this, the, the, that 10 second the delay in my head of going, I wear a prosthesis, like, you know, and he's kind of like, oh, okay. Like, uh, when I wear this hand, that doesn't really happen. No. Nobody's going to grab it on accident and panic. I mean, if it gets to a point where the hand is indistinguishable from feeling, texture, everything, to another hand, I could see somebody being interested in that. But at this point, I don't think I am anymore. Okay. So I don't so, know. So, I mean, that was, that was partly the, 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 the thinking behind my question uh, was whether or not... Like iRobot, right, where he really has no idea. <laughs> well, what do, you, do, do you need it? Um, you know, it's a... I suppose uh, we talk a lot about the, the the difficulty people have as hidden having hidden disabilities, talking about their disability, whereas yours most of the time is quite obvious. Um, and but you've shown situations where it isn't, uh, and the <laughs> and the effects that that can have. Um, so yeah, actually, you know, your hand's pretty damn cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really like it. It's uh, and I, that's I, the I, point. Like when they started making things cool. That's when everybody else has started to accept it as cool. Does that make sense? For so long, they were trying to make it like a hand, like something it wasn't. And then now that they've just kind of embraced that it's it's a bionic hand, it's it's robotic. That's what it is, and this is this is how it looks, and this is how it sounds, and this is this is the effects of it. And people are kind of just becoming more accepting because we've accepted that's what it is, yeah. and that's how it's going to be. And that's that's kind of cool for me. Okay, Deborah, I know you have another question. I, I do have a, another question, and you know, Angel, um, I, I was born with both my hands, and and I'm jealous of your hand. I, I just think it is so <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it's so cool, and so I mean, isn't that just psychologically so fascinating that we have come there? And and I'm not surprised in a way. Uh, my daughter, Sarah, born with Down syndrome, she loves the Cinder series. I don't know if you've read those books. I haven't Cinder, read them, but I know of them. I'm a big young adult novel fan. <laughs> yeah, so my, my daughter loves them. And by the way, so do I. Cinder, Scarlet. Uh, and it's about a young lady that was in an explosion, and she she was put back together with robotics and she's and it, it is a real that's what it's about i heard of it yes. I didn't know that. yeah and 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 they base it on the uh fairy tale story cinderella and I, knew that. I knew that part of it like that but what's interesting also is society has decided in the future that people that have over too many bionics maybe you're 36 percent bionics that you're not real human so it's very very interesting very interesting dilemmas and a very, very so interesting series. Called Deus Ex, yeah. I think that's also the plot line of it. Deus Ex called Mankind Divided. And I think that's yeah. their people with augmentations versus. Yeah, so we're thinking about it as a society, which is very interesting. And so, I always get questions like, whose side are you going to take in the, the man versus machine? <laughs> right. I said, I'm not choosing my allegiances too quickly. Yeah, so. yeah I'm still figuring that out. So, um, but. What a fascinating conversation with you. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that's really hard, and no one has figured it out. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with the United Nations, and I know that something that we're trying to figure out as a society, which you've already addressed some of this already, is how do we get this new amazing technology to the people that need it, not only the people in the United States and the UK and you know Europe, but the the children that need it, they're in Africa and you know uh, India and China. So I, I think they're having someone like you join these conversations 
could add a lot of power. I don't know what the answers are because these these devices are very expensive. And like you said, sometimes I need multi, multiple devices. Sometimes I need a device, even though I'm a four month old baby. Don't make me wait till I'm five years old. So um, I, I don't think there's answers yet, but I do know that that's something that, um, and I think things like 3D print, the 3D printing and the wearables and I think we're heading there as a society, but um, I was just curious if you wanted to speak to that for a minute or not. And I know Antonio has a question too, so I don't want to take too much of the time. It is definitely going to be a struggle um, just because of with, with prosthetics, it, a lot of time involves so much time. Like my socket is especially fit to my, my limb, my residual limb, and everybody's residual limb is going to be different. Um, a friend of mine, Sean McHugh, who's also one of the um, um, wearers of the Bionic Hand, his prosthetic maker has something called an ITAU system that he actually goes to um, other countries to fit, and it has um, adjustable settings for the socket, and that's a new thing. To be able to have something that's adjustable is great because I can grow with it, or the idea is that it doesn't need to be so specifically made. So to be able to mass produce these things, I'm not trying to sell his design or anything, but hopefully at one point that that can become a thing where somebody can make an adjustable socket because that's the most important part. You can't wear a, wear a prosthetic if the socket doesn't fit. It can be the coolest hand in the world, but if it doesn't fit, I can't get a day's use out of it. There's no point. So you need a good socket and you need a reliable hand. And when it comes to electronic stuff, it gets difficult in other countries depending on what's their electricity situation, what's their, you know, and there's so many different types and different things and I wish there was one one hand that did everything and hopefully we'll get to a point that does that but at this point in time like it's it's going to require a toolbox it requires a toolbox of things to do what you need to do good answer I'll turn it over to Antonio I know he has a question no uh, you are you already touched uh, in some of the things that that I was going to ask is, is about related with, with the technology and from contacting with with the with, with the manufacturer of your hand what type of uh, developments you see them doing from the side of the sensors and the way are you able to improve the way how you can do movements I am so excited about the new sensor stuff um, my hand is very cool my hand can do a lot of things. My hand can't do what it wants to do though, because the only sensors I have are on my flexor and extensor. So I have two sensors that I have to control all of the movements of my hand with. And that's kind of annoying. So they have a lot of new technologies. One of them right now that hopefully I'll, you'll see me wearing in the future um, is called Coact. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's pattern recognition. So it's many, many sensors that are placed around the socket and instead of the arm, it's okay, instead of the sensors being placed on flexor and extensor and them saying, these are the muscles you need to move to move your hand, they're telling me. I pick what muscles I move to move the hand. So for a traumatic amputee, so say they've just lost their arm and they're healed and you put them in the co-app system, you set them up on the computer and they say, pretend you're pointing. You do both hands and you point. Pretend you're um, turning your wrist over. Pretend you're and the sensors are, you're training it. There's a training. So you're telling it what to do. And then after that, after it's set, any time that you do that exact motion, it's going to go straight into that grip. And it's, it's so cool. I mean, obviously it's an early stage of development. It's not commercially available. It's, it's, you know, they're working on it, but it's going to be cool. And I'm really excited about it. The other thing that I'm really trying to worm my way into with, uh, please let me test this is, um, <laughs> they're called IMEs. They're, um, tiny sensors that are implantable electrodes. Um, so they're about the size of a grain of rice and they're put uh, under the skin of your residual limb because an issue that I have is sweat. I'm from Louisiana. You know, it sounds gross, but I have the contact of my skin and when I sweat, the, the electrodes slip, they move. Um, also, it corrodes the electrodes. It's not good for them. Insurance doesn't like that, but I need new electrodes because I've been sweating in my arm too much, you know? And then also, you don't have to worry about finding your sensor sites and the uncomfortableness of it, because that's another thing. I maybe could have worn this socket to do yoga. I maybe could have. But because of my electrodes, when I push down in certain positions, those electrodes push into the bone and different things like that. If they weren't there, it would be a lot more comfortable and easy to wear throughout an extended period of time. So there are definitely some really cool sensor developments that I'm really excited for. 
to, instead of having to, to cycle through or to to do certain pulses that the hand has taught me, I get to show it what I want to do. So that's nice. Okay, one one last thing before we close, because um, we're we're at the sort of half hour. Is um, we've talked a lot about your arm, but we've not talked about your acting, which is I know. You know we we focused we focused on 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 your disability and which and and your your arm, which is fantastic. But you know your career is you know partly around the acting and modelling and and yeah, and, and we yeah. So you know, obviously you've 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 been in the Hunger Games and and. That's that's fantastic. What are you What are you in next? What are you working on? Well, um, this this is a disappointing thing. I've been auditioning for something, a character that's missing her arm for the last three months, and I found out this past week that they decided to go in a different direction. And I'm thinking the direction they decided to go in is a two-handed person, because as I was auditioning, I think they were really realizing my arm can't do exactly what they wanted to do. Like you said, they're looking for Luke Skywalker type. This is not for Star Wars. They're looking for a Luke Skywalker type. They, they want that full articulation. They want all the things that my hand doesn't do yet. I wish it did, but it doesn't. And I tried my hardest throughout my auditions to, to make my hand to the best of its ability. And um, I can't say for 100% that that's, that's what they did. But that's what it seemed like, because throughout it, they were questioning and asking, well, can your arm do this? Well, what about that? And actually, you know, and I would do auditions where I was acting and I was taping things and sending it back and forth to them. And it, I think it more so revolved around what my arm wasn't able to do. And that was kind of frustrating because now they're going to be picking a two handed actor to play a one handed role. And I love Mad Max. I love Furiosa. Obviously, I've, I've dressed up as her. I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but I love I love Charlize Theron. She did an amazing job. But there were things in that movie where I watched and I'm like, a one-handed person wouldn't do that. Now, the general public might not know that. But to me, watching certain things, like how she fell at one point, I'm going, you wouldn't fall on your little arm like that. That would hurt like that. That's not how you would fall. Um, and just different things like that. I think it's really important to accurately and realistically portray these people with differences. And it's kind of sure. frustrating when they, I get it. They're a filmmaker. They're, they have the creative mind. They, they want to portray a certain vision. And if I can't meet their vision, then I understand why they don't use us. But at the same time, is that, is that, you know, um, doing society a favor, you know, I mean, I get it with some of these things that are supposed to be set in way in the future. I get that. Okay. That makes sense. But when you're trying to misrepresent something that's currently happening now, it's kind of like, what's, what's the point of that? You know, that's that's not what's going on currently. And and I um, had a disappointing thing happen this week. I found out that there's a casting director in my area. They All the casting directors here know me at this point. I'm from New Orleans. We only really have four casting directors um, in our area that, that film big things. And he was speaking with my acting coach. And he said something about my agent, who me and my – everyone knows actors and agents. Like, they love them. They hate them. They love them. They're back and forth. If you're getting me work, I'm happy with you. But my agent's great. I have two, one in Los Angeles and one in New Orleans. And right now it's been slow here. So I'm like, oh, he's not getting me anything. Like, you know. And then I found out that the casting director said something like, it really, really frustrates us, though, because her agent submits her for things but doesn't mention she has one arm. And my acting coach was like, why did they, why? Why do they need to mention that? Is the role an Olympic swimmer bio, biopic? Like, is it about a person that has two arms? Like, what, what's the role? Is it a uh, five and under? So is it a, where five, like less than five lines? Is she sitting at a desk? Is she, you've seen her cosmetic arm. You know that you can't really tell the difference. What does it matter? And he kind of didn't have anything really to say at that point, but it was the idea that, that they aren't called. That was, I, I now know that they aren't calling me in because of my arm. Before it was always something that I was suspicious of. I was kind of like, you know, they might not be calling me in because of my arm for this, you know? I'm probably never going to be called in for bikini babe. You know, even though everyone's like, oh, you're a cute girl, you're a pretty girl, blah, blah, blah. I'm probably not going to be called in for that role because an amputee is not what they see as being a bikini babe, which is kind of like, I wear bikinis. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> like, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a thing where it's frustrating that that's not how they see us. There was a TV show filming down here that did a lot of stuff with amputees, with people with differences. And, 
the casting directors know me as an amputee, so they kept putting me in front of the director saying, we had this girl, we had this girl, we had this girl. And they finally, after weeks of putting me in front of him, he said to them, I, I understand she's probably a great actress and, and I'll like her and all like that, but she's too cute for this show. Okay. And I was kind of like, but you're looking for amputees. Yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you've got to be more damaged, I guess. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, it's actually funny. I, I did it uh, for this uh, Danish art house project. Her name's uh, Ada Bilgard Sobe. She's, uh, she's great. And uh, I did this thing where I had to be a homeless youth, and she kept going, you're, you're too pretty here. We need a little more makeup by the black eyes and all this stuff like that. <laughs> and it's funny, though, because I'm not what people think of as an amputee because I'm, you know, an attractive young female or whatever. They, they think that's sad that I have one arm. My life is sad because I, and it's not. They, I, I can't, apparently I can't represent amputees because because not I'm not enough. the norm, and how do they know that? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we we have to close. We could carry on talking, but I know that the, that that, um, that that we're out of time. So thank you. I mean, I I really appreciate you taking the time today. We look forward to chatting with you on on Twitter tomorrow night. It's Amazing. Sure, Amazing. going to be cool. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing, <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll thank speak you to guys. you. Good. Good. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.